I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. My guest today is Alita Brill, an author, a social critic, and an advocate for women and girls. She writes and speaks with a woman's perspective, often about civil liberties or the issue of privacy or the need for social justice. But now, most recently, she has co-authored a memoir with her doctor about chronic illness. Hello, Alita. Hi, Ronnie. Thank you. You, you say in this book that you're, you said you would never write about your illness. Never write. It was my secret. Yeah. Only the inner circle knew about it. Uh -huh. And I swore I would never write it, and I never would have. Yeah. Um, but actually, it's my doctor's wife who pushed us. And, and it's such a lovely book because it may be about your illness, but in a way, it's not about your illness. It's about relationships, and especially the relationship with the doctor and his relationship with you and the young doctors that you talk about in the end. And then the difficulty of a relationship with someone special. I think what we wanted, both of us wanted so much, and certainly what his whole model of caring for the chronically ill has been. And his practice is almost all women. Yeah. Because, you know, in lupus alone, it's nine to yeah. one women. Just in yeah. lupus alone. So you have an autoimmune disease. I have an autoimmune disease, which means the body is attacking itself. And as you know, when the body attacks itself and it's mysterious, whether it's MS or lupus or Wegner's or any of the many other things, what happens is you blame yourself. Well, my body's attacking, and it's with so many women in the population. Yeah, women, women easily blame themselves. We wanted the book to be a book of hope and not a sick book. And the doctor's name is Michael Lockshin. Lockshin, and he is really, truly a very close friend of yours. He's a very close friend. Didn't start out that way, of course. It's, but it's interesting because you get his perspective when he sees a patient. You know, yeah. the whole doctor-patient relationship is so, it, it's so complicated, and it's changed so much in our lifetime, I think. Oh, Ronnie, it's changed Hasn't so it much in our lifetime. Yeah. You know, as I write in the book, you know, when I was a girl, all the doctors were men old enough to be my father or indeed my grandfather. And it was very patriarchal. Oh, and I would yeah. hit the doctor's office after my parents would work the system trying to get me to a doctor, a specialist, and there wouldn't be any symptoms. In those days, they thought it was juvenile rheumatoid. So my luck, right? I'd hit the doctor, my hands would be fine, I would look fine. And I started to realize these male, older doctors coming out of that tradition thought I was crazy. They thought I was a crazy girl. And so that's when you really started, when you, you told me before that where did the feminist start or how did you become that? Yeah. It was then, huh? When People you were 12 say, years old? when did you become a feminist? And I say before I knew what the word meant, I just knew that one time a doctor whispered to my mother, I don't think there's anything wrong with her. I think it's in her head. And my dear mother, who was about as big as a sparrow, how she ended up with me, I don't know, but she was <laughs> as big as a sparrow, she said, practically screaming, it's not in her head. It's in her bones. And she was outraged. And I understood that she was outraged because this doctor didn't take her seriously or me. Yeah, and I realized that I was a girl, and that was the difference. So that began my thinking even then that I wanted to be taken seriously. And of course, by the time I got into college, the feminist movement was going and I became so, a natural feminist. So what it is it like to have a chronic illness? Terrible. Mm -hmm. It's got its ups and downs, you said. It's actually not terrible. Well, you know, I say in the book what I really do mean, which is it hasn't been all bad. But I also say that I can't answer that question completely honestly because this is the only life I know. Mm -hmm. I got sick when I was 12. I've had very short periods of remission. Mostly I'm fighting it, I'm coping with it, I'm doing something about it. It's always present. In fact, it's so loyal to me, you know I gave him a name. I call him Mr. Rot <laughs> because he chews away on me and rots my life and rots my organs and rots parts of me. So I think anyone that's been this loyal to me deserves a name. And in a couple of years, He's going to be with me 50 years. We're going to have a party for him to say goodbye. <laughs> that will be nice. I hope you will say goodbye to him. But, you know, you've, you've lived with this chronic illness since you're 12, but you've traveled around the world. You've written books, essays. You're a very trained, respected researcher. You've done all kinds of things. How does that differ? Is that just the innate resilience that you have? What do you say My collection, my doctor would say, it's because I'm gritty and determined and I refuse to be defined by disease. And surely that's why I wanted to write the book. I wrote the book for the little Tell girl I was. People. I wrote the book so much for little girls and young women. For the young woman I was, for the little girl I was, so that there wouldn't be other young 
women and girls that experienced what I did. But I also think part of it has to do with my father, yeah. honestly, Ronnie. My father is a person that no matter what happened to him in life, every day was a new day, a good day, and you moved forward in life. And I always say my father was sort of a combination of Moses and the Dalai Lama. Um, so <laughs> part of it is parental. Yeah. Part of it is my father's determination that I not see myself as sick. And also, by the time I hit Lakshin's office, Dr. Lakshin's office, I was 30. And I was jaded and angry and sick of doctors, fed up with doctors. And here comes this younger doctor, not in this older model, who's wanting to know about me. And But more than anything, it's work and words and the movement for social justice for all people that I think has channeled or harnessed a lot of the pain. It's so it's so admirable and so good and so important and in a way when you translate it to the to the illness part I mean into the, the the subject of the body to inspire the younger people it's almost like the clicks and the consciousness raising isn't it of the women's It movement. is but sometimes it's very wrenching. Yeah. Um, I was giving a keynote address to the Lupus Foundation of America on Saturday uh, last Saturday mm -hmm. and uh, the annual meeting the keynote and because there's so much mother-daughter mm -hmm. stuff in the book, mothers who were young enough to be my daughters brought their daughters who were the age I was when I got sick and kind of wanted the daughters to see me and to almost touch me. And I, I was uncomfortable by that experience because I really wanted to say to the girls, look, it is really hard, and you have to work really hard not. But I realize that's not why their mothers yeah. brought them. Their yeah. mothers brought them to see a mature woman, a woman of middle age, shall we say. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't make any bones about it. I turned 60 in March. I never expected that's to be. That's very young. I, I never to tell expected you, to be. somebody who's almost 80. <laughs> I never expected to be 60. It's a yeah. triumph. It's a yeah. triumph. It is. So, you know, the thing I always say is, who would I be if I didn't have this disease? Well, I'd probably have managed to get into a good relationship, maybe, maybe. Um, but I don't know. Would I be as compassionate? Would I be yeah. as committed? Would I be as forgiving toward others? Would I be so determined that we will find cure to all of these diseases? I don't know. It's who I am. But I think the thing that the, Dr. Lakshin has taught all of us in his care, and he writes a chapter, as you know, called I Am Me. And by that, he means you're not a series of symptoms. So what I try to say always is this. All of these symptoms and all of these hospitalizations, by the time I was 30, I'd been in the hospital almost twice that many times. Mm. Those are the footnotes of my life. The text of my life is elsewhere. And I think that that's the struggle and certainly not some hallmark moment of, oh, isn't this a great blessing to be sick your whole life? Well, you've been touched enough by illness, tragedy yeah. and illness to know that it's not a blessing. But it's how can you use it. But out of it all, you do become stronger. You do. Well, you and do. More and an appreciation about life. I mean, you know what's, what's urgent. <laughs> but the crucial thing is the doctor-patient relationship. Yeah. Let's talk about it. You alternate chapters in the book, which makes it very interesting. Thank you. And this is a doctor who, who sees the person, as you just said, not look only the chart that he's read. I love early in his in his career when he said he liked to come out to the yeah. uh, the, yeah. the waiting room. Yeah. I I I go to a, a radiologist who's uh, very big and successful nowadays. But I was a patient when she first started. She used to come into the waiting room, hello, right, right. and come yeah. in and take yeah. it. So it makes such yeah. a difference. But he still does, even though the physical setting is different. Yeah, he tries. But even if he can't do that, he, everything about him, I think, is defined by one sentence of his. Mm. He says, we must first and always come together as people, not as mm. savior and supplicant. And so he fights against any tendency in other doctors or colleagues when he sees the arrogance. You know, his view is patients should be arrogant because we're the one that survive. Yeah, right. We're the ones that survive this or cope. And he has to solve the problems or try to. Or try to. And, and advise. Yeah. That's, he seems very um, 
He's very centered about advice, right? He doesn't want to push. Except when he always he says, everything's, he, this is what he loves to say, everything's negotiable until I say it isn't, <laughs> <laughs> which is a, a kind of humorous yeah. thing, but it's true. Yeah. He knows when you can't negotiate yeah. it, but he allows all of us to live lives. He doesn't go forward to a quest for diagnosis just for diagnosis. He goes forward to see, how can I alleviate suffering, pain, and of course, he knows things I don't want to know. Yeah. He knows things all of his and patients And he knows what you don't want to know, so he doesn't tell you. And sometimes I will say too much information. Yeah. But I think that more than anything, what people who are never going to be well and may or may not have shortened lives or longer lives as I have had, very fortunately, more than anything else, we have to believe in ourselves and in our self-worth enough to know that if you're not building toward dialogue with a doctor, if you're being dismissed, if you're being fluffed off, if you're being seen as a crazy woman rather than a crazy girl, you need to move on. And you, you, can't, you can't do that unless you believe in yourself. And sometimes I have had people say, you know, I gave my doctor a copy of your book and I said, could we work on a little more dialogue? Oh, good. So that, <laughs> I think, is the key. They're trying to teach that, aren't they, in medical school they increasingly? Are. They are. And I think it's, I think it's a long pull. Yeah. And I think it's a long pull for a very reason, a reason that is very unpleasant to say in public. Their careers, even the best of them, their status, their money, all of it is dependent upon our limitations. So you already have this very unequal playing field. You have to be honest enough to say that, yeah. to say that this is a dyadic interaction where my problems and my sadness and all the things in life I haven't gotten to do or be, including mo a mother, for example, you know, this helps your career. And it's only a doctor who's centered and secure that he sees that the us versus them barrier has to come down. It's so interesting. So with all of this, you traveled the world and you did a book about women leaders? Or I women did. who were going to be leaders? Well, women, it was for the Beijing Conference is oh, what it was. was. Oh, it yeah, was. it was for all the women And leaders. what did you find? I mean, what were these women like? Well, they, were, they ran the gamut. You know, they, they were every one from people we know, like Bella's in that book, Bella Abzug was in that book. And interestingly, the piece that we chose about Bella was about her marriage. Uh -huh. And at first, you know, she didn't like that, but then she realized she did want that because her marriage had, had worked. And it was the public-private. She used to call me, in the, <laughs> she'd call at a 1 o'clock in the morning when she had an idea. And I would say, Bella, I, we're sleeping. Or am I, and Larry isn't happy about this, or she'd yeah, call at yeah. 11 and I'd say, or we're 10, yeah. we're doing something, and Larry's not. She said, aren't you an independent woman? I am. And she would get so annoyed. <laughs> oh, Bella was amazing. Bella always called me Alida. She refused to call oh. me Alida. And one time, my father, who wanted me to be Bella Absic, actually, my <laughs> father was absolutely wanted me to be Bella Absic. He finally <laughs> met Bella, and uh, I introduced them. We had been on a platform together on Suffrage Day. And so he said, there's just one thing. Would you mind calling my daughter Alida? <laughs> And she looked at him and she said, for you, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> she once said, she called the Israeli consulate, she said, my name is Bella Abzug. He says, no, it's not Abzug, it's Abchuk. <laughs> and she then commented that, what the nerve of him. Anyway, yeah. go on. <laughs> but there, you know, there are women leaders that aren't for women. And I think yeah. that that's the, I mean, we've seen that. Right. And what I think the most the important, think? I think the <laughs> difference is whether or not you see the world through the prism of what is going to be just and equal for women and for girls oh, you can see this power. and the suffering and whether you see your position of power, whatever that position is, whether it's municipal, federal, international, whether you see it as the ability to move forward the rights of women and girls. And, you know, those are human rights. They're not women's rights. I always say, you know, That's women's right. rights are civil rights. Absolutely. They're human rights. And, uh, of course, the part of my life that's changed so much is not the illness. The illness gets worse as I get older because I get tired. Yeah. And the disease gets younger. It's to see the women doctors, Ronnie. Oh, that's, you know, that was the most touching end of the book when you talked about being surrounded. Talk about them. Well, uh, interestingly, when you first started, yeah. did you ever see a woman doctor? No. And nurses were my great unsung heroes, and I always want to say that what nurses did for me is to make this life possible. Right. I would have collapsed without nurses because yeah, the doctors could be quite mean. 
the doctors could be quite gruff. Mean is perhaps unkind, but the doctors could be quite mean. Insensitive. And insensitive <laughs> to a child. And here would be these wonderful women who would come and make it all right. And sometimes they would intervene for me, talk to the doctors. Yeah. Nurses are the great unsung heroes. But of course, I never ran into a woman doctor until much later. Now, <laughs> there we are. And when I was finishing the book, I had an unexpected hospitalization. Since the book is published, I've had several more, but we didn't know that then. But here I was in this room with this extraordinary young woman about to have an ascendant career. She had done a very unpleasant and terrible procedure on me. Uh, she came to check on me. It was late on a Friday. I said, what are you doing here? And she said, well, my kid's already asleep. I might as well talk to you. And she came right into my face and she shook her finger at me and she said, I have a bone to pick with you and my mother and your entire generation. I was flat in bed and I went, what Ooh. doctor, what? And she said, yeah. you told us we could have it all and we can't. And we ended up having a kind of a, a feminist 101 seminar dialogue with her sitting next to my bed. And what I said to her is, we didn't know. We, we didn't, didn't realize how hard it would be. And so I think one of the things I've learned is, yes, we have these extraordinary women who are going to be brilliant doctors and already are, but the structure isn't there. They also want to have lives that include personal things. They want to have children, many of them. Where do they put the children? How do they do the daycare? How do they do? I mean, that's you why know, daycare has always been such an enormous issue, but it's always been framed around poverty, and it should be instead of just a, a whole feminist right. issue. Yeah, and right. so what we are seeing, unfortunately, and we're seeing it right in this city, is a number of women are deciding to go into less demanding fields of medicine. Hmm where they're not going to get that 2 a.m. call, that 3 a.m. Yeah. call. But we need women in intensive chronic care because so many women are ill with chronic illness. We also need women who want to be cardiac surgeons to be cardiac surgeons and not feel they can't do and that. And there is, there is a difference, isn't there? Even with Michael being so wonderful and an exception, with a woman doctor and a male doctor, most often. Yes, he's the exception, I think, perhaps because he's the father of a I'm daughter. I'm calling him Michael. I love that. Yeah, well, he'd love that. Um, <laughs> he, I think partially because he is the father of a daughter also. That's I think true. that helps. I think that you know, he has helps. One, one, yeah. one daughter. Um, and he has a wife who's very strongly for women's rights and women's equality. And I think he's learned a lot from patients like myself, and he's learning more and more. But every once in a while, I'll catch him. And then he will always say, I had to learn to be a feminist. But I think that what we need to do is to find a time where we can teach doctors, and perhaps that's really yeah. a larger doctor-patient dialogue, where we show them, well, what does it feel like to have these diseases that no one understands, to be sort of in the women's population, the women's shtetl, if you will, of disease, when there are still doctors out there who should know better, but will still say things that lead women down to the, oh, okay, uh, it's because I, I weigh too much. It's because I eat the wrong food. It's because I'm in a bad relationship. It's, it's so, so easy. The blame business with autoimmune disease. But aside from your disease, generally, I've always said it isn't being a feminist. It's that we do have a different perspective, usually. I think we and do. Th yeah, and that's... I think we do. Yeah. And there is... Except I wanted it not to be the case. Yeah, but, but you know, when you're surrounded by women physicians, by and large... Now, there are right. some women in the right. old model, you like know. Like are leaders of the world. Uh, yes, there are some women that are not in, the, in our they're model. Playing the game. I mean, they're yeah. playing the role. And, you know, they're, not, they're yeah. not at all in our model. But by and large, to be surrounded by women when you're feeling vulnerable and to see their white coats in the MD, what does that feel like? Well, first of all, it feels like what all we did with our lives, Ronnie, was good. <laughs> we didn't waste yeah, it, you know, yeah. behind the barricades, on the barricades, yeah. and you in public office. Um, you know, it, we did make this progress that has led us to that. But, but it's it very also, difficult. It's also the subtleties and, and the nuances. And it's still there. I mean, I have two daughters who both have stopped working yeah. and are home with kids. Yeah. Now that the children are back in school, they're starting again. But there's that, you know, those women feel uncomfortable because the other women are still right. working and they're looked down. It's a whole thing. And it's the a physician, very complicated the physician life. in this book said to me, 
her husband had made the choice to come home to work. Yeah. So he's not a house husband, right. but he's certainly not having the kind of career he would have had. And so she says, you know, what if I didn't have that husband? And she said, I have many colleagues, she told me, many colleagues that aren't going to be able to have these sorts of careers because their husbands yeah. can't get out of the traditional And that roles. comment goes way back. I remember when I went to college, Millicent McIntosh was the dean of Barnard College. She was married to a doctor who was very prosperous. She had five children, and she was the dean of the college. It's so easy, and a lot of the graduates all say she misled us totally. Of course. And then I had a friend who, uh, who wanted so much to be a mother, and she was a television news person, and she saw Betty Friedan in a restaurant. She said, that's not possible. <laughs> do it yeah. anyway, so it does, and it is, it's, it's, a, it's a way to think, because the men have to change also the to make it possible. The men have to change. Yeah. yeah, and a lot is required of younger men now yeah. than what than was required right. of the men of our generation. Yes, I think we do require more yeah. sensitivity and I understanding. I think we do, and we some of the men more more <laughs> actual hands-on involvement yeah. right. than we would have thought of. Right. right. Do you find have you spoken to patients that have problems with their health insurance that they aren't able to? Health insurance continue? is an enormous problem, and um, you know, just now I needed to go in and get some. Uh, drugs and the insurance company danced around a little longer than they should have, speaking of dancing, and not a good dance. And, you know, Dr. Lakshin ended up being quite frustrated. And, you know, then what happens is you wait too long because you can't get your authorization. Then you end up in the hospital. It costs the, the insurance Much companies more. ten times more than if you'd come in as an outpatient, get your chemo, get your infusion, get it whatever you need. Pre-existing is hugely mm -hmm. Big yeah. in in my part of the world, in anyone with any kind of continuing disease, whether it's diabetes, it doesn't matter what it is, anything that isn't going to go away easily or at all. The pre-existing, you can't change insurance companies. Sometimes you can't change relationships because you need it. You can't change a bad job because you need it. And of course, with so many people losing work, what is the great fear? Mm -hmm. The great fear is insurance. No, a very dear friend of mine's son lost his uh, job recently, and I think they gave him two weeks medical insurance. Now, he's young and he's healthy, but what if? What if? What if? Right? Are you following the debate in Washington? I am following the debate in Washington. And when, do you know when they, I mean, there's some deadlines that are so far away yeah, that when things yeah. start, but the, the um, pre-existing seems to be one of the major things that will happen, don't you think? I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. And you're not old enough to be covered by Medicare. Well, and of course, the, I won't be until I'm 66 because they changed the, the rule. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a whole group of us that won't be eligible until we're 66. Life becomes so complicated. And then, of course, what is pre-existing? What does yeah. pre-existing mean? Does it mean if you have clean blood tests for three months, you don't have a pre-existing? Does it mean if you ever had it? You know, and of course, I can get insurance for anything except what I have. So that's the other thing. I might come down with heart disease or breast cancer like oh, anyone else. So that I could get insurance for. So it's also sort of stupid of the insurance companies because they say, okay, we'll cover this, but we won't cover that. But person is a whole human being with all sorts of things that can go wrong. So the whole question of civil liberties and independence and social justice is all over us, right? Well, and I often think <laughs> that civil liberties is often confused with civil rights. I think we often need to look back again, pull it back. If we have a certain number of liberties that we are guaranteed, whether it's reproductive choice or whatever, but we are not able to enact those liberties because of restrictions, poverty, finances, then aren't we being denied a civil right? It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And you wrote, did you write a whole book? I uh, wrote Nobody's Business, which was, was. Uh, the paradoxes of privacy, and it's a triptych, Ronnie. It looks at the three times in our lives when we're the most vulnerable, birth, sexuality, and death. And, and I said nobody's business because at that point it was so much about what government was trying to do and what people that this didn't. This was before Terry Schiavo or after? That? This is uh, before Terry Schiavo, but there was, you know, there were others. And yeah. unfortunately, um, it, it was uh, the Quinlan girl at that point. Oh. And she kept going on right. and on and on. Right. And it was also during the height of these lovely young men dying of AIDS, the plague right. years. And the way they were scapegoated, the way they were seen as, you know, other, not, mm -hmm. not citizens, not even human beings. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, 
I called the last chapter about privacy and death last rights, R-I-G-H-T-S. <laughs> and it was so interesting to me because much of what I argued for, counseling before death and all sorts of things, came back to bite President Obama. And I thought, wait a minute, I wrote that book a long time ago, you know, the death panels and all that. But what I argue for in that book is that people need to be informed. People need to Absolutely. be informed and need yeah. to be able to make. And this is so true with, with chronic illness that is severe because at some point you do wind down. Do you think, this is such a silly question, but do you I doubt think you could ask a silly chronic question. illness has made you think more about everything? It certainly made me think more about other people. It certainly made me see the way other people have to live and have to suffer, how people try to compose a life. Yes, I think that I wouldn't be who I am, I think, if this hadn't happened. If I come back again, I would not choose to come back with a with chronic a illness, but it really hasn't been all bad in that I think that it has, in fact, made me more passionate and less frightened to stand up for others, even strangers. And when, when Mr. Rott is back, is it so bad that you can't think? That's the thing I worry about the most. Just the other day, I was in the hospital having Cytoxin, which is an anti-cancer yeah. drug, because I have to turn off my system. And there was a period where I was so nervous, and also I know what it's going to do to me 48 hours out, that I had no words. And I thought, what am I going to do without words? What am I going to do without words? So for me, because I didn't get to but be you a mother. Thinking. <laughs> but I was thinking. I didn't get to be a mother. I've not been very successful in intimate relationships. It's all very precious, those words. The words are sort of the, the words of the story, right? And you tell wonderful stories. Thank you. And I, we're at the end of our <laughs> discussion. It's been but so thank great. you so much for coming. Thank you. And wonderful to be with you. So much happiness in your life. You too. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.